Hey there, and welcome to part 9 of the Amateur Extra Element 4 License Study. Alrighty, so we're going to start with question number 1 from sub-element 2, Charlie. What indicator is required to be used by U.S. licensed operators when operating a station via remote control and the remote transmitter is located in the U.S.? And there is no additional indicator required. No additional indicator is required. You don't have to say stroke 1, stroke 4, stroke 8, stroke 7, indicating the area that you're transmitting from. So no additional indicator is required as long as that transmitter is in the United States. Which of the following file formats is used for exchanging amateur radio log data? And that is ADIF. And now ADIF is a standard and if you go to adif.org you can read the whole standard. These are just some of the QFSO fields right here that you can have in the ADIF uh, version 3.14 and I also have an example of one of my ADIF files right here from a parks on the air activation that I did and you can see that there's a call, there's the mode, there's the band frequency, you'll see my station call sign so that is what that looks like right there. So ADIF is produced primarily by another program. So you might use AC log or log, uh, ham, ham log or some of those other programs. Usually you'll just use a program to create your ADIF files. All right, let's go to the next question. Uh, from which of the following bands is amateur radio contesting generally excluded? Now, from down here in your choices, it's 30 meters, but there's quite a few of them in the work bands. There's 30 meters, 17 meters, and 12 meters that the World Administrative Radio Conference, also known as WARC, those are the work bands, 30, 17, and 12, where you do not contest. Those, those are just for chasing a little DX and locals having conversations. That's where you escape from the contests. Which of the following frequencies can be used for amateur radio mesh networks? Those are frequencies shared with various unlicensed wireless data services such as Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is one of those in the 2.4 gigahertz range that we share some of our radio mesh networks. And you'll see in a minute there's another question about this. What is the function of a DX QSL manager? Well, the DX, or the Distant Station QSL Manager, handles the receiving and sending of confirmations for a DX station. So that's a DX QSL Manager. Someone in Europe may have someone in the U.S. as their QSL Manager, and you send it to their U.S. address, and then that QSL Manager will get enough together and send them a package. So that's how the handling and of receiving and sending confirmations happens. During a VHF UHF contest, in which band segment would you expect to find the highest level of single sideband or CW activity? And that would be in the weak signal segment of the band, with most of the activity near the calling frequency. So if you're going to participate in single sideband or CW during a contest, you want to go check out the band plan for VHF or UHF and find out where those segments are so you have the best luck of finding a contact. What is the Cabrillo format? It is a standard for submission of electronic contest logs. And I have a Cabrillo right here. And it has a different format than ADIF. So you can see how it is, and it's just space or uh, space delimited. And there you go. So there's just one example. Which of the following contacts may be confirmed through the logbook of the world? L-O-T-W. Well, all these choices are correct. You can have special event contacts between stations in the U.S., contacts between a U.S. station and a non-U.S. station, contacts for worked all states credit. All these choices are correct. 
And as of filming, if you go to Logbook of the World, this is pretty much what it looks like. Question number nine. What type of equipment is commonly used to implement an amateur radio mesh network? And that would be just a common wireless router running custom firmware. If you're interested in that, you, you look up mesh networks and you could find all the information you want about how to get that custom firmware on a wireless router. Why do DX stations often transmit and receive on different frequencies? Now this is called operating split. So they might call, and I'm gonna use just regular frequencies, they, they may call on 14.250, but then they'll say that I'm listening five to 10 up. So you would transmit on 14.255 to 14.260 and then they'll be looking for someone that's in the clear up there to call back. So because the DX station may be transmitting on a frequency that is prohibited to some responding stations. So they may, in that aspect, they may tell you where they're listening. To separate the calling stations from the DX station. That way everybody can hear the DX station. To improve operating efficiency by reducing interference. So if you hear somebody saying up, 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 that means that they are listening away from where they're transmitting. Question number 11. How should you generally identify your station when attempting to contact a DX station during a contest or in a pileup? And now to explain a pileup, that's when you, if you just listen and you hear what sounds like a lunchroom cafeteria, that's the pileup. But you send your full call sign once or twice. That's it. Send your call sign once or twice. What indicates the delay between a control operator action and the corresponding change in the transmitted signal? And this is called latency. And there may be latency between satellites and Earth, too. That latency is the time that it takes for it to reach Earth. I have a lot of latency when I talk because sometimes I forget what I'm about to say. And I have to think about it. So that's what latency is. It's just a delay. This has been... Sub element to Charlie. I'm Robbie W1RCP. Make sure to subscribe to my channel to show your support. Thank you so much and hit that like button.